the Simons Institute workshop on sampling algorithms and geometries on distributions. Uh, so today is uh, our uh, last day of the workshop. I hope you have enjoyed this uh, workshop in the past week. Uh, we will have three speakers uh, in this morning's section. Uh, our first speaker is Professor uh, Jonathan Mattingly. Uh, he is a professor of mathematics at Duke University. So as we all know, uh, he has done a lot of amazing work in stochastic analysis and sampling. And uh, many of us have used uh, the result from his paper, so including myself. So today uh, he's going to talk about MCMC for quantifying and uh, Jerry uh, Mandarin. So Johnson, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you very much for this invitation. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm sad that I haven't been able to be there. Um, and, and because of scheduling issues on my end, I've, I've had to watch the talks I've been able to see asynchronously, but I've enjoyed them. But I, I also, that means that I was a little nervous after watching some of the talks because um, although I usually give the theory talks at conferences, this is not a theory talk at all. This is, uh, this is kind of, this is a talk that in, is inspiring me to think more about interesting theory that I haven't thought about before because there's nothing like a really good application to force you to, to, to actually discover that things you thought were obvious and worked well, sometimes don't work well at all in practice. So let me, uh, let me go ahead and just get to it. So uh, what I wanna to talk to you about is an application, an application that I think is interesting because I think it's, it's harder than sampling the Ising model, but it's easier than, than doing protein folding. So maybe it's an interesting example for some people to think about. All right, so let me give you a little bit of the background. So it's, it's this problem with American democracy. Right now, across the country, um, the census is going, the census data has been released to the states and they're in the process of taking these, these census data and drawing new districts. So every state's divided up into districts, whether it's for their state legislature or whether it's for the congressional. So in this case, it's, I'm talking about North Carolina's congressional seats. So, and these districts are used to elect people for Congress, for instance. And so they take the vote of the people and translate it into election results. And what's it may be more surprising, very interesting is the exact structure of those districts are incredibly important for the outcome of elections, all right? So, you know, in some ways I think of the vote as people's will being expressed and then how those votes lead to people being elected is how we interpret that vote. And what I wanna tell you is that you can take the same set of votes and elect three people from one party and whatever it is, 10 people from the other, so you can take the same set of votes. And if you use a different set of maps, you get completely different election outcomes. All right. So somehow the, how the maps are drawn are the absolute most important part in many ways of interpreting the votes of, of the people. So, so, you know, here's some, let me see if I can get my, the zoom out of the way so I can see my slides. There we go. So different maps give very divergent distant results, even though they're using the same election votes. So that leads to a question about which map should we use? All right, so oops, here we go. So, and this is often referred to as gerrymandering, which is this idea that you can manipulate or change the outcome of an election by changing the boundaries of the districts, all right? And here's an old picture. It's a very old problem in American democracy. It goes back to the 1812. And so this leads to the question, which is often asked, well, what would happen if there were no political agendas, all right? And implicit in this discussion is our idea of comparing to what should have happened or what would have happened, all right? So what we wanna discover is we wanna discover how the rules and policies interact with the political geography of a state. And what I mean by political geography of a state is the shape of the state, where the people live, where people of different parties live. These are all kind of, and it's not just parties, it's, you know, different socioeconomic groups, different racial groups, different, you know, different, different where people, you know, what, what types of jobs people have, different, different, uh, different, uh, different vocations, right, where they all live. And so we want to understand how they interact and to create this translation from votes to election outcomes, all right? So here's three, four historical maps from North Carolina. Three of them were used in actual elections and one of them was drawn by a set of judges who were retired who wanted to see what would happen if could they make better maps. There was half Republicans, half Democrats. And um, you, know, you might wanna ask, well, how can I compare and contrast these three maps? You might just look at them, but what I'm gonna to try to convince you of briefly, although mainly I'm gonna talk about sampling here, is that if you pick, just draw maps by 
If you just judge maps by how they look, you'll be misled. So here are those same four maps. And one way to compare them is to have a bunch of other maps. So here's a bunch of other maps that you could compare them to. And what you might wanna ask is how does the property of these maps, you know, now I've made even more maps and I've kind of gone ahead and labeled as an ensemble of maps. So we wanna generate an ensemble of maps and compare how those maps compare to the maps we're interested in. And just to kind of give you a little bit of motivation, I'll tell you that the work that I'm gonna talk about, much of it has been used in these court cases, in fact, and it's not just my work, it's other people's work. There's lots of people who have gotten involved in this. Um, we were doing some of it at the very beginning, and now there's a great number of people working in this. Um, and one of the reasons, unfortunately, I've been at watching this conference, which the talks I've seen have been very interesting asynchronously is because I, I, a conference I was involved in was moved, unfortunately, to conflict with this conference and um, that I was organizing. And it, it, it's, it's unusual. This was a conference sponsored by, if you look down here, the, the, the public policy school, the law school, the, all these different entities and the math department, which is maybe unusual. And that's because in the middle of it, one of the headlining set of talks was a bunch of talks about using quantitative methods in redistricting. So this is really something that the practitioners are really interested in. All right, so let me tell you where I'm gonna go, where this is gonna go. So in the beginning, there's kind of three steps I think of this. The first one is how do you define a distribution? So I'm gonna define a probability distribution, right? A, a, a distribution on the space of all possible redistrictings of the state of North Carolina. So you can think of that, if I think about North Carolina being made up of precincts and the adjacency graph giving me a graph on those precincts. So there's about 3000 precincts. I have an adjacency graph on that, which is a planar 2D graph typically, but not always, but you, we can just pretend it is. And then I wanna encode a distribution on partitions of that graph into the number of districts I have. So in North Carolina right now would be 14 districts. For, let, for, the state, for the congressional delegation. And I want to encode the law, the policy into some energy function, into some score function, which will I'll use as a Gibbs measure. And then I'm gonna, second step is I want to build an ensemble, which just means I want to sample algorithmically draw from that distribution, right? And there's lots of different ways people are thinking about this sequential Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, enumeration for small ones and Markov chain Monte Carlo, which is what I'm going to talk about today. But then if I had more time, if you gave me another hour, I could then talk about number three a lot, which is actually a fantastically interesting kind of field of scientific communication of how do you explain these ideas and how do you transmit them to, to the courts and to policymakers in a way that they can find digestible and useful. All right. So I'll say a little bit about that at the end. All right. So by the way, please, I can't actually see you guys right now. It's that always the problem on Zoom because unfortunately, usually I like to have my other iPad up and running, but it's not running for some reason at the moment. Okay, Jonathan, so I have a question. So why do you use sampling instead of optimization? Because um, the goal is not to optimize and find, first of all, it has to be a political conversation, okay? So it's not like there's a computer that's gonna spit out a set of maps and they're gonna use these maps. So I'm not, I'm not in this conversation, although this is a separate conversation, I'm not thinking of using this as a way to produce the map we use. I'm thinking this is a way to compare whether the map they pick is in the neighborhood, in the kind of realm of reasonable maps given what they care about. So I'm gonna, instead of doing, it's the same reason you do Bayesian statistics instead of just picking, picking the maximum likelihood. I'm interested in the actual distribution of maps that are, would be allowable and not just the one that minimizes some functional, okay? Right, so you should really think of this as kind of a sampling problem that would be akin to thinking of kind of sampling from a likelihood in some Bayesian, Bayesian sampling problem, all right? So there's those three steps. Did, that, did I answer the question well enough? Yeah? And now I'm gonna define some probability distribution. So I'm gonna give some score function and define some Gibbs measure here. And that score function I'm gonna take what a reasonable thing is just a sum of the independent factors that kind of, they're not really independent because they influence each other, but you think of them independently. And of course, by adding them like this, I'm taking in some sense the, the maximal entropy measure within the constraints of these, these observables that I have here. So population, some idea of compactness, people don't want counties to be split or they don't want cities to be split and they maybe want 
depending on where you are, compliance with the Voting Rights Act for minority representation. So for compactness, we often take isoparametric scores. We often just take L2 population deviation from some ideal population. And then there's other kinds of ideas around uh, communities of interest or affinity scores where you're in California, I'm not, but if you're in California right now, there's a real lot of talk in Michigan and California about communities of interests and, and then the Voting Rights Act. So all of these things kind of, I'm gonna, not gonna talk about how we encode them mathematically, but here's some ideas. And we create some, some, some score function, okay? Some, some energy function, if you will, some likelihood, some log likelihood uh, function that's gonna use to be kind of saying, how good is this map at satisfying our criteria? Um, so, okay, here was a little bit about municipal scores, but I'm not going to talk about that here. So, okay, so then what I'm going to typically do is use a version, you know, just use vanilla Metropolis Hastings. Um, so we all, everyone here, I think, knows Metropolis Hastings. So I'm going to do some type of exception rejection. And Q here is my proposal chain. So I'm going to have some Markov chain. And so C is a coloring of my graph. And I'm going to propose moving from one coloring to another coloring, and then I'm gonna do the standard kind of rejection step, all right? And one of the reasons I'm putting up here is just to remind you <clears throat> that if you're not having, if you don't have a reversible rejection, you need to be able to calculate forward probabilities and backwards probabilities, all right? And here I just have just the vanilla Metropolis Hastings, not, you know, with the standard kind of uh, except, except rejection scheme. So there should be a min one here, I forgot to say that. Um, all right, and of course, the reason we picked this is it gives local detailed balance when we're in equilibrium. So a flux is across the boundaries and we'll come up, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. All right, so there are basically two basic types of proposals that are usually used. So of course, Metropolis Hastings has two parts, the energy and then the proposal. I mean, the proposal and then the energy function. So the first one is just what you might call single node flip, which is like an Ising-like move, which is the first thing anyone would try. And then the second one is a much smarter global move, which is is kind of a recom or merge split move, which I'll talk about. All right, so here's the simple um, Ising move, which is how we started off. So here's Iowa actually divided into four districts. So each of these little dots is a precinct and the colors represent different congressional districts. And you might take, look at the interface where edges that are between two different colors, the conflicted edges, if you will, that don't agree in their colorings. You pick one of them at random, or maybe you do some kind of Gibbs probability, you pick some kind of heat bath, like a globular dynamics, and you pick one according to that. You pick one, and then you pick a direction to shift the color across. That's the easiest thing you could do. And that works okay, but it's not great. A better idea was the idea that, that Duchin, uh, DeFord, Duchin and, uh, and Solomon came up with, which was <clears throat> each of these uh, partitions induces a small subgraph. So here's a part of North Carolina. So I have it divided into three districts, and they each induce some subgraph. I could pick two of them according to some rule, maybe at random, and merge the green district and the orange district. I'm assuming you can see my pointer. If you can't, please yell. And then merge them into a new district and then draw a spanning tree, right? We have good algorithms like loop rates, random walk to draw minimal spanning trees. I mean, you draw a uniform spanning tree or you could use minimal spanning trees, but that's a different conversation. But so right now I'm thinking of using like Wilson's algorithm, loop rates, random walk to draw a uniform spanning tree. And then since one of the most important criteria here are balanced populations, so we want to draw balanced partitions. So what we can do is we can walk across the tree, walking across the tree is a nice order n criteria uh, uh, um, operation. So we can walk across this tree and find an edge that we could cut and maybe find all the edges and pick one of them at random. Whoops, sorry. And cut this red edge here where my mouse is. And then we end up with two new partitions, all right? And repeat this. So that was the idea of this recon. Now, the problem with that is, is that no one, it, we don't know what it samples from actually. There's some strong evidence that it's pretty close to uniform on spanning force <clears throat> of these partitions, but it's not, we don't know that for sure yet. And, uh, and, and the other problem is that you can't metropolize this very well because calculating the reverse direction of these arrows is very expensive as I'll tell you in a second. So, and I want to emphasize right now, so we don't, I don't actually really want to use either of these algorithms. Now, some people do use these algorithms. I think it's the wrong thing to do. You know, we, and from the very beginning, we've emphasized that we always want to have, be sampling from a Gibbs measure. So we always want to use some rejection scheme to really be sampling. We want to metropolize, to be sampling from a measure that we can design, that can follow the policy considerations. And one of the reasons for that is that, 
<clears throat> the decision, the discussion about choosing this measure actually really sharpens the conversations around policy and I think makes things clearer, all right? So what we wanna do is we wanna be able to, so here I'm merging some, I'm doing the same thing we did before, but I wanna be able to calculate the forward and the backward probabilities, this orange arrow, so that I can metropolize, all right? <clears throat> I just wanna emphasize that. So now let me propose a variation, which is kind of metropolis forest recon. <clears throat> so before we really thought of these as partitions, and we actually have a variation on this where we still do, but I think it's easier to explain this first as a spanning forest algorithm. So instead, let's actually keep track of the tree structure. So now when I merge these two, we're going to again end up with this merge district, which I'm going to again draw a uniform spanning tree. And then I'm going to split it. And now I'm going to end up with two spanning trees. Now that sounds like a subtle, almost imperceivable change. But the important thing is, is that, okay, I have this probability, but I also can then calculate the backwards probability. Because now again, I'm starting from a spanning forest. I can actually calculate the chance of drawing this spanning forest and then moving backwards to, and then cutting it to end up with this, these two spanning force induced on the partitions, right? So, so the point is we really need to be able to calculate both the forward probabilities, the black arrows and the backward probabilities. And so here, let me try to, uh, let me actually, before I do that, this, this slide is, I wish it was in a different place, but I guess I left it here. So I'll just deal with that for a second. Um, <clears throat> when we do this, we kind of, we're switching from thinking about partitions to spanning force and in doing so, um, we, 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 this tau is the number of spanning force on a partition. We introduce a parameter gamma, which we're gonna to use to kind of move our measure, forgetting about the effect of J. So if J was zero for a second, <clears throat> when gamma is uh, at zero, this is gonna be uniform on spanning force. And when gamma equals one, it's gonna be uniform on partitions. And we're really interested in spanning sampling from partitions because that makes the most sense from the policy point of view. But, but it's actually, this algorithm naturally samples on, on spanning forests. And that's going to be a problem we're going to have to get around. And so, so this is the mathiest slide I have here. So I'll just tell you, the problem is, is that if you see, so we, we start off with, a, if we think about starting off with a partition, we start off with a partition, then we merge two of the partitions and that's a many to one map. Like there are many partitions when merge create the same big partition. And then <clears throat> we pick a random spanning tree on that. And that's a one to many random map. And then we split it in a way that keeps it relatively balanced into two trees, spanning four trees on each that induces a new partition. And that's a few to many. And then if we erase them and collapse back to partition, that's a many to one. And the problem is, is that what we really wanna be able to do is invert this map and go backwards. And this red step is really expensive to invert where if we just stopped a moment earlier, if we just went from trees to trees, we wouldn't do this last collapse. And it, then it actually, it's like, in, it's like um, augmenting our state space when you do kind of Bayesian sampling and you wanna augment the state space to make sampling better. So we're gonna keep track of extra information that we're not actually interested in, but by, in, by kind of, by lifting our probability measure up to spending for us, we get a algorithm that is much more feasible, okay? Okay, so that, that's great. But the problem is, is that we often want to preserve entities like counties in a way that is hard to do, even with the score function. And more to the fact, we often sometimes need to be able to go down to much smaller geographic entities. So in North Carolina, there's about 3,000 precincts. <clears throat> if I started introducing um, census blocks, which is a smaller block, and I got rid of ones that are ridiculous, I'd still be left with something between around 80 to 100,000 census blocks. And maybe I could call them, merge them together, but still that's a lot more. And the problem is that this algorithm drawing these spanning trees becomes quite expensive, relatively speaking, especially, and then doing this reversible step becomes expensive. So what we've done then next was we developed a multi-scale algorithm for, for, expand, for sampling these partitions, which I hope you'll find interesting. So what we're gonna think now instead is we're gonna first, so here I have a, a, a tree, a spanning, a, a, a tree on this space, where I've represented in kind of a multi-scale way. So I both have these, these biggest blocks are counties, and then I have precincts, which are these smaller blocks, if you can see my mouse. And then right here in some of these areas, it gets even smaller, and those are, are even smaller regions. So let's what we might do first, so is draw, merge two regions. So draw the dark, take the dark gray and the green and merge them into a place, into one, 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 one subgraph. 
at the county level and then draw a spanning tree, which is very inexpensive because there's not a lot of counties here and then pick a place to split it. And then once we pick a place to split it, <clears throat> we then resolve our graph only in that one area. So now we draw spanning forest on the smaller graph, stipulating these where these cuts are essentially. And then we find places to cut that and we could continually iterate this down to like, you know, we have code that does multi-scale drawing these multi-scale objects, which is an interesting point of view, I think, all right? And that of course makes things much cheaper because the expensive things here are like running Wilson's algorithm and calculating the determinants to calculate the number of spanning trees on these spaces. So, so you know, these are somewhere between high n square n squared plus high delta, just just shy of n cubed algorithms. So we want to be able to, you know, having this logarithmic partitioning of our scales gives us much better, um, much better algorithms. All right. So here I, I can't not show you a movie. <clears throat> so here's a uh, whoops. Here's a movie, should start. Let's see if we'll start now. There it goes. So here's this algorithm running at a couple of different scales and you'll see it periodically kind of resolve different regions and not resolve other regions as it moves around. And it's running pretty, this is of course a movie, this isn't real time, but it's not so bad. It's, it's, it does a pretty good job. Now, of course, this is just our proposal. So we have this multi-scale proposal. Then it's actually a bit tricky to, to keep track of forward and backward prob probabilities across this hierarchy, but we can do it by introducing some ideas about marked edges and keeping track of some data structures that keep track of some interesting, some of the data so that things run more efficiently. We can turn, unpack some algorithm, some steps into um, constant cost or O1 cost, I mean, ON cost. All right, so let me come back to this. So let's see, how am I doing on time? Yeah, I'm doing kind of okay, not great, but okay. So, um, so let me go back to this. So, you know, we had this, energy, this function here, and I, and I wrote it this way, and I'm really writing as a partition, as an energy, a Gibbs measure against the base measure of uniform sampling of partitions. If I'm now interested in doing something on a spanning tree, so I need to introduce this weight here and a parameter gamma, which, which <clears throat> kind of interpolates between uniform on spanning trees when gamma is zero and uniform on partitions when gamma equals one. And that's what these two are. Although I think I have a typo here, maybe. Um, and the reason it's important is that if you, if you're uniform on partitions, you end up with, and so what this is, is this is a, a, a kind of a simulated state where we have a city in the middle. And so the thing about cities is, is that they have lots of edges from a few small city precincts to big county precincts around them. And what, what's, what, what these two are is one of them is where we sampled so the, 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 the width of each edge gives how often that edge was on the boundary between some districts. So I think we split this into three different districts and, or five districts, either three or five, I can't remember anymore. And, and all I really want you to notice is if I sample on partition space or tree space, my cuts come in different places, right? There's this red is the difference between them. And so if you don't want to introduce some biases between how cities and rural areas interact, biases that weren't explicit in your measure, your Gibbs measure, your, your cost function J, you have to be careful. So we really want to sample from partitions because we think that that's the right policy driven measure. And so we need to think about how, to, and, it, and I'll just tell you that when we sample on partition space, our Markov chain is very poorly mixing. And when we sample on tree space, it's very good mixing, okay? So here's a bigger picture of the same ones kind of blown up. I'm just, I, I, I'm kind of giving you this at a cartoon level just to motivate what's coming next. So what we've, what we've done and other people for a while have done is we've looked at various ideas of parallel tempering and simulated tempering. So in other words, we're gonna run chains at different, you know, one of them at the bottom is gonna be driven, is gonna be on, is better mixing in a mathematically convenient distribution, this time on tree space. And then here we're gonna have a worse mixing policy driven distribution, which will have more compact districts will have beyond partition space. And we're gonna do this standard te parallel tempering algorithm. That's to say, we're gonna, we're gonna have walkers at different, this is actually more simulated tempering, if you will. So you're walking on one temperature and then you periodically jump up and you walk there and then you jump up and you move around. But you could also do parallel tempering where you have chains running at each temperature. Now, one thing that we've had, and I'd be curious to hear other people who have experience giving me ideas, <clears throat> 
But once, and here's some different chains as they're switching between different values of beta, if you will, these gamma levels. Um, and so these are what gamma index they're on, somewhere between the zero and one, gamma equals zero is trees and partitions. And these are different, these are different threads in a, in a multi-core version of this, multi-threaded version of this um, algorithm. And so we're walking up and down um, and by swapping chains. So when you do that, you want the swap probability to be pretty good and in a way rather uniform across the state space. So you wanna make these changes in your tempering parameter be very small, but sometimes we would need to do as many as 400 different temperatures in this problem, even though it's you know, not as bad as you know, something like, like uh, protein folding. And of course, 400 temperatures either means I need a lot of compute power on, on, you know, on, on, on the Amazon cloud or the Google cloud or something like that, or Oak Ridge has to decide to give me a machine, or I have to do something smarter. And one of the things we're experimenting with is kind of, since this seems to have, there's a very directionality to this, we're, we're doing smaller chunks of parallel tempering where we kind of build up a good sampling of our measure and then use that as a heat bath almost to, to feed plans at, at a lower gamma into the higher gammas uh, parallel tempering chains. And so we can do that in a way that still preserves measure. And that's, so that's been, you know, this is pretty fresh work and it seems to be working pretty well, but we're making progress. All right. So, um, so now I have way too many slides on the next topic. So I'm going to skip some of them as I go through, but another thing we tried at one point was to replace Metropolis Hastings with something else. And there's some nice ideas that other people have had, like sequential Monte Carlo that seems to be working. It's a little bit related to the parallel tempering in a way. Um, but another thing you could try to do would try to do non-reversible Markov chain Monte Carlo. So, you know, the classic example that goes back to Neil uh, Holmes and, and Diaconis in the math literature for sure, and, and, you know, various other people in the physics literature, is the idea instead of replacing diffusive random walks, which is essentially what sampling is, with some type of ballistic stirring. So, right, if, you know, if, if you're just going to sample these nodes uniformly, if you do random walk, you're going to need n squared to cover, just to typically cover everything. Here, if you just ballistically run around it, you're going to only need order n, right, to sample every vertice of this graph. And the idea of lifting is you still run a metropolized scheme, but you make, make this move on the left out of two ballistic moves. And whenever you have a rejection, instead of just sitting still, you switch whether your momentum is taking you in the plus direction or the minus direction. So in some ways, this is a, a version of kind of a Langevin, you're giving your chain momentum. So it's a Langevin, a discretized momentum version, all right? And as I said, here are some references. So, um, so we had two different versions of this. One where we actually you know, went back to the stirring your coffee analogy since we're in the plane. We actually put a vector field on this and we tried to stir the center of masses of our districts, the centroids of our districts around according to a flow. But we also had another version where we, where we just tried to have different momentum, just decide whether the green was flowing into the purple or the purple was flowing into the green at the moment. And, 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 and had a whole graph of momentums between all of the different uh, districts. We had all the different colors here. We'd have a different momentum between them telling which, at this moment, which way they were flowing. And so we did that. And, uh, and uh, so here's just a little bit. So the idea would be you propose a move. If it was in the, you only accept, consider moves that are in the direction of your stirring. If it rejects, then you flip the direction of your stirring, okay? And so it, it, here's, I'm not gonna go into it. Here's just an algorithm. It looks a lot like Metropolis Hastings, but it has this extra momentum in it. All right, and so let me uh, skip this. And we have, so let me show you a movie here. So here's a toy example. So this is one of these, the simple middle one is tempering. The one on the right is reversible, a non-reversible, and the one on the left is reversible. And the thing to notice here is that the one on the right will eventually flip over because we have a stirring. Um, and the one, so, and the one in the, the two in the middle will not do as well. Uh, so eventually this will flip over here. There it goes. But this is kind of a simple toy example, which is much better than you could ever hope. And the graph at the bottom shows a little bit more of the truth. So um, actually it turned out that having this momentum did no better than just doing some smart tempering in our problem. That is to say, instead of uniformly picking which way to do single node flip and do the Ising move, but picking them with some tempering, we did much, much better. 
And the center of mass still did best in a simple example, but when we got to bigger examples, we actually saw the center of mass degrade and it's a lot more expensive. So we're not actually using this right now in our sampling, but it was an interesting idea. And it led to kind of a discrete version of, oh, in a way, a Langevin sampling. Yeah, there's a, we haven't finished writing that up, but there is a version of this, which has not, not discrete plus or minus momentums, but more uh, uh, continuous momentums, which would be more like Langevin sampling on this space of graph partitions. All right, so, um, right. So, I mean, we did see some nice properties. We saw kind of movement from these metastable states much better in the blue one, which is the center of mass split. But, um, and after, you know, after only 25,000 steps, it had moved around a lot more. The center of mass was more equally distributed where uh, the two districts were kind of more split on, had a certain orientation that had to do with the initial condition. But after 10 to the seven steps, they both did just as fine. And it wasn't, that, you know, if you actually counted comp computer cost and algorithmic cost, the center of mouse wasn't much better. All right, so uh, right, and that's what this says, but I don't, I don't think I have time to go into that in huge detail. All right, so let me actually. There's a general idea about subdividing your graph into different spaces and assigning momentums. If you're interested, I'm happy to talk about that. So we kind of create a partition and we assign momentum into different partitions of our state space not of the graph space, but of the actual state space. So this works very well. And, and then we have different chains associated with different momentums. We're gonna, uh, you know, a whole stack of different momentum. Um, it's nice theory, but I don't, it didn't work so well in this example. <laughs> All right, so, okay. So there's a lot of work going on. So I'll, I'm gonna just quickly mention two other ideas, which are maybe outside the topic of this chain of this conference, but I think they're interesting to think about. So the first one was some work that started with Alan Fries and Maria and Wes, and, um, and, and it's been used actually in, in a couple of court cases also. And then we, we kind of had a, uh, an extension of that. I worked with them to do an extension of that. And it, it's really the idea about, all right, um, you know, it measures just the fragility of a gerrymandering, but, but the idea is, is that sometimes to measure whether a, something is an outlier, if you're not trying to exactly sample from the distribution, you actually can use a not a mix a chain which isn't whoops sorry a chain which isn't mixing. So what's interesting about this these methods is they don't use any they don't require any mixing guarantees. So some so it's an interesting question. It's, it's an example of if you know what your question is and your question is is this thing an outlier relative to this distribution? Is this example that I have an outlier? How far in the tails is it? You can actually do something with with guarantees that doesn't require you to faithfully sample the whole measure. It just needs, in this case, it just needs a reversible Markov chain Monte Carlo method. So like Metropolis Hastings works just great. Um, and it really can give you bounds. And so this is something I think is important to think about. We don't always have to have the intermediate step sample the di distribution well. For certain types of questions, you can actually, you don't, you don't need guarantees on your sampling rates. Um, another thing which has been very interesting is to uh, actually come up with smart, clever enumeration techniques that prune the tree and actually enumerate every single partition in small cases. And uh, this is some work that uh, Kizuke Inima and Ben Feitfield really uh, pioneered in this area. And I'll just say that in, in one of our court cases, we actually, this graph to your right here was actually, here was the purple was what we got by our sampling methods. And for this small sub part of the problem that was actually interesting in its own right for the court case, we were actually able to enumerate it completely and show that our sampling method was doing a really good job. And so, uh, you know, we actually presented a clever, uh, you know, a state-of-the-art enumeration method in court as a validation for a sampling method. Okay, so I think I have maybe 15 minutes left. So maybe it's a good, is that right? About 10 minutes, maybe 10 minutes left? Uh, yeah, about oh. 10 minutes left. Uh, maybe only five, actually. I just remember you said 40, not 45. So no, no, you'll start a little bit later. You have 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. All right. So um, what I'm about to go to now is to explain how some of these ideas could be used, but I'm also happy to take... So so let me let me just take a little bit of time to explain how we explain this to the court um, and maybe show you some of the out some of the products of this analysis. Um, and then I'm happy to go back to the algorithms. And I know I went fast over some of that. I'm happy to talk more about it. So... Um, the kind of things we do is if you look just for a second over where my cursor is at this histogram. So we've taken some, you know, tens of thousands of maps. We've actually converged them using some kind of 
Gilman Ruman statistics and looking at the total variation distance of these plots and some other plots, some projected marginals to see when those converge. And what we get is this histogram. So given a certain set of votes, we got this histogram of the number of seats for a particular party elected. And we could compare like the map that we were given and then a map that was eventually the court put in. And what's interesting to note though, is that you know, here's the same kind of histograms, but now in a whole bunch of different elections. So here's governor from 2012, US House from 2016 presidential election in North Carolina from 2016 president, 2012 Senate governor, all right? And they're organized in more Democratic at the bottom, more Democrat dominated to more Republican dominated, sorry, more Democrat dominated at the top and more Republican dominated in the bottom. And so as you would expect, if we're counting Democrats elected, these blue histograms move to the right as we increase. But what's interesting is if you look at these purple dots, which are the maps that we actually used in 2016, the outcome almost doesn't change at all. So in some sense, the people change their opinions dramatically between these two different sets of votes at the top and the bottom, and the outcome of the election didn't change almost at all. Where if you use some more bipartisan drawn maps or some random maps, they actually, it does change. And that's what this blue histogram shows. And so now there's a movie and these kind of movies we show in court. So here's the statewide vote fraction slowly ticking up here. And as it does, you see the, the, the blue histogram of our ensemble of maps shifts to the right. And then this map that the court eventually put in place moves with it, but this enacted map stays dramatically behind. It doesn't start moving until almost 55%. So okay, I'll play it one more time. It, this map doesn't really start moving until around 55% Democratic vote in the state of North Carolina, which is a lot. That's not realistic outcome. North Carolina is usually in the high 40s to the low 50s. So that's so for the most of where the election takes place, this map doesn't, the, the, the purple map doesn't have any response to changing opinion of the electorate. Here's another similar type thing. And again, the same kind of thing where here's a whole bunch of elections. Here's the line, the dotted line that I'm highlighting right now is where the supermajority is. Here's the change of the control of the party, of the, of the chamber. And you see over here where it's mostly Republican dominated does a very good job, but it's not such a bad map. The purple dots aren't so far off from the histograms, but as the power would be in danger of swinging to the other party, these purple map, the purple map dramatically underreports the election outcomes. And if you watch this movie now, um, you'll see that this overturned map that was overturned in a court case in which I testified will be stuck for quite a while. And, and this, these use these sampling methods that I'm talking about. And, and now, it, you know, you'll see that this overturn map will, will delay a long time in crossing this dotted line, which is the supermajority being broken. That's the, that's the number of votes you need to override the governor's veto. And now as this slowly shifts to the right, you'll start seeing that it, it will, the blue histogram and the yellow map will shift completely, giving the Democrats the control of the chamber long before this purple one finally does. There it goes. And this picture down here is maybe a little hard to explain right now, but I can explain it in a different picture. What it measures is whether there's whether districts have an abnormally, this is where we'd expect districts to be in the middle of these box plots. And these purple and the orange ones were districts we actually used in elections. And what you should take out of this is this is the amount percentage of Democrats on the y-axis. And these districts have abnormally, abnormally high numbers of Democrats. And these districts have abnormally low numbers of Democrats. And so what's happened is they, for political reasons, they've stuffed Democrats in these districts to take them out of these districts. And this is an effect called packing and cracking. So we can identify such effects and explain them to the court. And another thing that's important, I just can't help but say to everyone is that people talk a lot about proportionality when they talk about elections in the United States. Our elections really should have nothing to do with proportionality. And what's nice about this ensemble methods, these Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling methods is that we can discover what the correct relationship should be given our geography of our state and the rules we have in place between the votes and the number of seats without invoking proportionality, which to be honest has nothing to do with anything in our, in our elections. Our elections aren't designed to create proportional outcomes, right? They're designed to make sure that, 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 that there's some geographic distribution of our representation. And, and I'm not going to talk about this, but yeah, we'll skip this. And we also do some spatial stuff to try to explain where things are actually harmed 
at a spatial level in, in, in our election analysis. Okay, great. And so with that, I'll just stop maybe from you know, an educational point of view. One thing that's interesting about this is these are all my collaborators over the years and I, maybe I've left someone off now, it keeps growing. But um, a lot of these are undergraduates and master's students. This type of work is really motivating to them and it's a very kind of diverse group in every way you can expect. You know, very least of which is what their actual major were. I had political scientists and economists and, you know, every type of engineer you can imagine, as well as math majors um, and stats, stats majors and computer scientists. So it draws in a really broad group of people. And so all these UGs are undergrads, which is interesting. All right. And, and I should also say that if you're interested more in this, we have a website that has a blog that explains lots of these ideas in small little descriptions, as well as you can find links to all of our court cases and all of our um, papers that we've posted on the archive. Um, and so maybe with that, I'll just stop with this movie. And uh, oops, yeah, sorry, I, I should have, I meant, I thought I'd updated this one, but I seem to have not saved the updated version. So anyway, ignore my conclusions. They were for a slightly different talk, but um, that's what I wanted to say. So thanks a lot. Um, I'm happy to any questions? Yeah, thank you for the great talk. Yeah, let's take a few questions. So I will start my question. So uh, in your experiments, you showed us uh, different uh, maps generated by the something algorithms uh, oh. developed by your team. So I wonder uh, what is the way to evaluate the goodness of the, for example, the policy or, or the map you generated, because I don't see any comparison between, for example, other maps generated by, let's say, human experts or some other workers. So do you have a, right. such a kind yeah. of comparison? So there's two answers to that. So first of all, um, mm -hmm. if you look, if you look at, you know, like these maps, these blue ones here, I mean, these, uh, these green ones, are actually drawn by human workers, right? But a, a nonpartisan group that was trying to, so we have some validation that, and you see they're pretty central to our, uh, if you look, they're in the middle of our box box here, if you can see them. Yeah, yeah it's I can see it. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it goes, finally, yeah. bandwidth. So they're not so far off from the centers of our box plots where these are really far off. So, so that's one way we do it. The other way we do it is we actually, uh, we actually, when we design this, 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 uh, when we, let me just get rid of this, this part here. When we design this energy function, right? These are kind of nonpartisan criteria. We tune them. We're trying to get better about it by using some kind of inference techniques, using some Markov chain Monte Carlo inference techniques, but we mm -hmm. tune these maps to be centered around the values of these functions, the compactness, the equal population score that we see in historical maps. So we say, even if our maps look like your maps in these nonpartisan criteria that you say that you use, how mm -hmm. do they look like, what do they look like in the partisan criteria? And we see that they're very different. That's one thing. And you know, to this audience, I'll say two things. One, uh, first of all, I mean, the theory is pretty wide open, right? We don't even know like this, re this randomly spaced forest tree thing. We don't know what it samples from. Uh, there's lots of interesting places for people to come up with performance guarantees. And, and these same kind of problems can be used in all different kinds of graph partitioning algorithms, we think, um, where you want to, you know, split into groups. I had a student who was thinking about this with some statisticians about, about dividing up into groups that had subgroups for experiments so that they would have the same, some certain properties, you know, like kind of marginal table type sampling problems. Um, but there's also, um, I should also say that there's some interesting use of the machine, la machine learning that people have used uh, in trying to kind of judge, do these maps look like these other maps if you, you know, in nonpartisan ways, right? So that's another thing people have tried to use to try to learn the distribution and then uh, learn the score function in a way to make it quicker to make these, these algorithms faster, yeah. So when you say then the score function, do you mean then the coefficient that is of i in front of each? No, I mean the actual, the whole thing, this big J, right? Oh, okay. So, so we actually pick these score functions, we, but then we have to fit the alphas 
we have to fit the alphas to make it to make it look like maps that people tend to use. Oh, right. I see. I see. And, and you know, and that's that's the interesting part. I mean, this is what you know. This is an interesting. You know, we can run some of these parallel tempering runs in five or six hours, right? Um, and so it, mm -hmm. it, it's a hard enough problem that. That, 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 you, that you need good ideas, but it's easy enough that you can actually play around with it and have some ground truth. You can actually look at these maps, right? In mm -hmm. a way you can't look at some very high dimensional protein folding problem maybe, right? So, uh, so, so I think it's an interesting test problem to think about. Yeah, indeed, yes. So any other questions from the... Uh... So, so I, I, I had the kind of a more general question. So, so you mentioned that uh, there are many uh, theoretical questions that, that arise from, from this work, and we have a very theoretical crowd here. Uh, so I know, I'm sorry. One, one, one uh, question usually... is... <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, sorry. So, so one question is, uh, you know, if one, one wanted to work on some of these problems, what would be a good place to start? And, and uh, yeah. um, even just looking for kind of... Uh, I don't know, reasonably well-defined questions. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so here's a, here's a few questions. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, so for instance, there's no performance guarantees for the simple, if you just run the proposal algorithm, this recom algorithm, there's no performance guarantees there, right? Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no, as the problem scales within, how does it behave, right? No one knows that. Another problem is how, you know, anything about how, as I change this measure, as I change this measure here, uh, you know, how, if I think about partitions, how do these tree counts vary given that I'm restricting to certain types of compactness, right? There's some, very recently, there's some work about the fact, how the isoparametric score relates to this this kind of tree count, right? Mm -hmm. um, another interesting question is here, I've been able to use, I've been able to use uniform spanning trees drawn by Wilson's algorithm, but what if I want to use like a, a greedy algorithm, right? Like Kruskal's algorithm to draw a minimal spanning tree based on putting weights on the edges, right? Like we know how to do. Mm -hmm. um, how can you metropolize that? If I'm drawing my spanning trees from that, from, from, from MS, MST, minimum spanning tree, how could, could I metropolize that, for instance? Right? People don't know how to do that at all, right? Um, there's also some interesting questions about, uh, we think that these kind of plots that I've shown right here, I'll show you one more. I have two more questions, then I'll end. Uh, let's see, where's the plot? Let me show you, right? These plots here that I have, these histograms, we kind of see this, these are kind of an order statistics, but they seem to follow in a nice, fairly regularly spaced thing. We don't have any understanding of what, of what that, what the parameters that affect that are. And, and even more to the case, um, we see that if we only care about these observables, these marginals here, the chains actually mix faster than if we care about the whole distribution, it seems. So in cases where we can enumerate the problem, and they're still pretty big, not super big, but kind of big, small to medium size. We see that if we wait for the entire distribution to converge in total variation, it takes much longer than these marginals to converge. And actually these marginals are all we care about. So is there, what about the geometry of this phase space means that these marginals converge faster, right? Um, all right, so these are just the projections of the, the partisan makeup of the 13 districts here. So there are 13 specific projections. You can think about here's 13 projections that have some kind of well spacing property. They mix much quicker projecting onto one variable from the space than the actual chains do. Uh, why is that? What about the geometry of the space makes that true, right? Yeah. Yes, thank you for sharing those very, very interesting theoretical questions. And uh, in the interest of time, uh, probably we should uh, wrap up here. Uh, let's thank our uh, speaker, Johnson, again for the great talk. Thank you, Johnson.